mean, I've always been interested in nature. Kind of mother nature's perfect animal, you know? Seeing Nile crocodiles and being kind of terrified. Welcome to the Nature Talks podcast. <laughs> Hello to all, I'm Irfan Peluzi and welcome to another of our Nature Talks episode where learning turns to understanding and understanding into conservation. So this time's Nature Talks episode is a very exciting one. I've got here with myself Joshua Power, uh, WWF contributor, conservation biologist and national geography explorer. So hello Joshua, how are you doing? Yes, no, very good, thank you. Um, sending best wishes from the UK. Thank you very much. So Joshua, before we begin, can you please introduce yourself on what you do and detail about what is actually the main talent of yours. Okay, so, um, as you mentioned, I'm a, a conservation biologist, um, which essentially means that I'm interested in, in the science and practice of, of conservation. How can we protect endangered species? Um, I've recently gone back to university to start doing a PhD um, with the Zoological Society of London and UCL in, in the UK. Um, and I'm an advisor for the Queen's Commonwealth Trust uh, on environment and society. Um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, one of the WWF uh, Voices influencers uh, for WWF International, which means that I host series all about environment, conservation from around the world. And it's um, an incredibly interesting way to, to learn about and share some of the challenges that our planet is facing today. So Joshua, of course, um, how do you think our connection with nature has changed over time? What a question to start with. Um, I mean, if, if we were to just look at the past 150 years, um, because I, throughout the course of, of human history, obviously that relationship has evolved and developed. But if we were just to look at the past 150 years in particular, um, and if we were to look in particular in uh, the area where uh, I live at the moment, uh, Europe as an example, because of course each of the areas of the world um, have experienced this differently. There have been some fairly profound shifts during this point in time. We've moved from um, a point in time when the natural world was there to be exploited, was there to be conquered, was there to be controlled, to a point in time where we're now aware of the tremendous challenges that the natural world is facing, largely as a result of human activity. And the question now is, what can we do to help change that interaction such that we can help protect the natural world? Um, really, that's the challenge of the 21st century. Of course, just speaking about um, nature of what you're speaking today, what was the main speciality or what made you interested to go and explore the natural world? That's a good question. Um, I think I've, I've always been interested and I, I was very fortunate that I grew up in the south of the UK um, with fairly easy access to nature. Um, there was woods on the doorstep and I used to love spending time in them. And I think that's really important for um, anyone growing up that they have ac close access to nature because it kind of helps foster and develop this love of the natural world. Um, and for me, that's really been the driving force all the way through. Um, I've, I've always been interested in trying to do what I can to help protect the natural world. And I, I know that lots of other people feel the same way. That's amazing. So Joshua, of course, speaking about, um, of course, for people who are listening to this and will be listening to this, how do you think we as human beings, as, as a species on, on, the, on the planet, depend on the natural world and its creatures, of course? The, the natural world and, and biodiversity more generally, um, which is the diversity of life in the natural world, underpin almost everything that we do. Um, for a long time, scientists struggled to put that into words. We knew, we knew it happened, but we had no really good way to kind of conceptualize it or explain it. Um, and then fairly recently, we've begun to formulate a lot of that thinking around the ideas on ecosystem services. And ecosystem services essentially explain everything that the natural world provides to human society, whether that's fresh water, clean air, some more direct provision, um, and ecosystem services really underpin our economies, human health, and human well-being at large. I mean, it's it's absolutely fun, fundamental. 
Now, of course, um, you're just speaking about, of course, the dependence on the natural world. We, we all get an idea, you know, of evolution. So what do you think evolution of life uh, played a role in human civilization, the development of human civilization? Um, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, we still don't fully under know. Uh, we, we still don't fully understand that, I think it's fair to say. And scientists are, are continuing to work to this day to better understand the history of human evolution um, and the history of, of, of natural evolution. And there's a lot of good work that's being done by institutions like the Natural History Museum in London to better understand that. Um, there were certainly um, points in human history that we'd like to know more about. Um, and that might be, be really important to understanding our relationship with the natural world over these very long periods of time. Now, just well, of course, speaking about nature and its damages, and we have seen many news like the Amazon and uh, Germany's flood and all these things. So, of course, as we know it, uh, we have seen that nature has an extraordinary power of regeneration, but it, it needs to be given a chance. So, do you think that there is still hope for the planet? Yes, yes, I do. I'm a fairly optimistic person. I believe there still is hope, <clears throat> but really, there's only hope if we act now we have reached that critical tipping point that we've been talking about for the past 20 years and 20, 30 years. <clears throat> and as you say, we are increasingly seeing signs that we are approaching that point of time when the opportunity to act is here. If we miss it, there might not be hope, certainly for the sort of world that we might want to live in in the future. Whereas if we take action now, there is a strong chance, for example, that we could meet the um, agreed targets of, for example, one and a half degrees Celsius um, temperature bracket set out by the Paris Climate Agreement. And that would obviously have huge benefits, not only for the natural world, but also for human society and the way that we organize those societies. Now, of course, um, mentioning about nature's regeneration, of course, if we, if we mimic nature and the actions that we take, like the amount of trees that we that, is, uh, that are felled every single year, and of course, the amount of recycling happens, and, and much more, we can help save our planet. There are many ways in which we all can help, by driving less cars, using more public transports, and of course, much more, which will be going in more detail. So, Joshua, you have been to many different places, and um, of course, you, have, you may have been hearing a lot and seen a lot. So, what are some successful conservation stories that you have heard or seen? Well, there's, a, there's a lot we could go into, um, but I, I think I'd, I'd use one fantastic example from South Korea, um, where I've been working for my PhD, um, and I'm a visiting research student at Seoul National University. And Korea has a very interesting relationship with the natural world, and particularly with its very diverse mammal population. A great example of that is around the Asiatic black bear. Um, your listeners might know this animal as, as the moon bear. Um, it's a member of the Ursus genus. Historically, um, suffered from persecution in the start of the 20th century during the colonial period in Korea, <clears throat> and then uh, overhunting following independence. And this is a really good example of how a negative interaction between human society and species can be reversed whereby there are now really successful conservation efforts to restore the Asiatic black bear to its native range in Korea. So down in Jirasan National Park, um, the moon bear has been successfully reinforced there. There's now a flourishing population. And the hope is, is that that might go on and recolonize South Korea. There's also really impressive efforts led by Project Moon Bear in order to help the captured bear population, because of course, the second part of the story is um, the captive wildlife trade, which is a huge part of humans' interaction with the natural world. And Project Moon Bear have been doing some fantastic work to help rescue moon bears that have been held over um, in bear bile farms that have, have continued to persist despite the changing legislation around them. Um, so South Korea is a really good example of, of bear conservation both in terms of reintroduction and re-establishment of wild populations through a reinforcement program and through successfully helping rescue captive bears that are involved in the wildlife trade. And, and that's a really positive success story. Of course, I completely agree with you. I, 
it's really extraordinary that we have the power to save our planet. We have done it not only for moon birds, but for many different species. Whales, for example, or, or, or for example, pandas. And, uh, and so we have shown that we can take action if we want it. So Joshua speaking about um, saving such species. Now, how do human societies these days interact with the natural world? At, at the moment, um, I think it's fair to say that, that different countries and different societies interact in very, very different ways with the natural world. And that's part of the core challenge. And that's part of the challenge of working for conservation is in a lot of ways, it's about understanding an individual society and culture and how it is interacting with the natural world and, and species that are present there. It's very hard to make kind of broad sweeping generalizations. But again, if I was to, to speak about Europe, which is where I live, um, it might be possible to summarize that essentially Europe's increasingly moving towards um, a position where we're looking to reintroduce species, where we're looking to bring species back. We realize that something is out of sync with the way that we have interacted with the natural world. And there's an increasing focus um, on restoring species that we've historically persecuted, on uh, improving our agricultural practice, so environmental-based subsidies for, for farming, for example. Um, there's increasing recognition of the damage that um, uncontrolled urban development could do and the need to have effective planning controls around that to ensure that only the most sustainable and well thought out development goes ahead and that we protect sufficient areas for nature. Um, and so there are some very encouraging signs that are coming from Europe in the current day and that's, that's a great example. So just speaking about the interactions uh, with the natural world, so now, now how, do, how do you think we can utilize that interaction to you know, help conserve biodiversity on the planet? Well, one of the most important things about the way that we interact with the natural world is this great sense of love for nature that close interaction can cultivate. I've already talked about my personal experience and how important that was for me, spending time in nature while growing up. <clears throat> and that, that essentially set me on uh, the career path and life trajectory more broadly that I'm on at the moment. And my hope is, is that that also has an impact for lots of other people, not just in the UK, but all around the world. <clears throat> and I think that's really important, therefore, engaging with young people and getting them out into nature. Um, there's some very uh, impressive programmes, both in the UK and in lots of other countries, to do just that. Because if people love the natural world, and if they care about it, then they'll be interested in trying to save it. And, and fundamentally, that's really important. Um, and obviously, there are so many more kind of specific things that we can do. You've already talked about, for example, resetting our relationship with the natural world when it comes towards resource use, and particularly the role that um, recycling, um, public transport, all of these sorts of, of things can play, but also the way that we think about natural resources. So whether that is looking at the most unsustainable practices that we do and simply saying no to them. So whether it's, um, for example, the, the wildlife trade in endangered species, um, everything from uh, shark fin um, to uh, the bile of, of bears, just to use our, our bear example from a minute ago, um, both of which are widely traded products for the wildlife trade. And simply by the act of saying no to that and looking to clamp down on that, we can help reset that relationship with the natural world through our utilization of wildlife products for these endangered and threatened species. I can believe with you are uh, absolutely, um, Joshua. So. As Joshua mentioned earlier, um, Earth itself lives with its biodiversity. It operates just like a living, beating organism because its habitats, made up of countless different species, work like its organs, each with a different role to play in, in, in keeping the planet healthy. So, Joshua, now speaking about action, you know, let's say for myself or, or for everyone who will be watching or listening to this, what do you think as an individual, what can each and sing, uh, every single one of us do? to help regain our balance with nature and save our planet? So 
So I think first and most importantly is to take stock of your own life <clears throat> and think about where your greatest impact is. So if I was to use myself as an example here, I'm aware that because of my work, um, because I'm, I live in the UK, but a lot of my work is overseas in different countries around the world, areas where um, there's particularly important biodiversity that might be under threat. <clears throat> I recognize that one of the potential biggest areas of impact for me is around transport. Now that might not be the case for everyone. So for, for someone who doesn't work overseas, who maybe doesn't take holidays overseas, that might actually be a far smaller area of their impact. And it, it might, for example, be around their food consumption or around their energy usage. But as I say, for, for me, it's transport is the biggest one. And then you have to think about ways that you can individually tackle those areas that are of the biggest impact for you. So in my case with transport, something that I've attempted to do is that while I have to unfortunately fly between continents when it comes to doing work, within a continent, you can almost always take public transport. Now that, that can lead to some incredibly long journeys. So a good example would be is that I uh, had to speak in, in Rome at an event um, and so I took, took the bus. Um, I needed to visit uh, Romania, so I took the train. Now, these are long journeys. It took 18 hours to get to Rome from London. It took about 36 hours to get to Romania from London. But that's part of helping think about what our biggest impact is and then looking to reset that in a more sustainable way. Um, and so that's a very individual one. And I'd encourage all of your listeners to think about what individually is their greatest impact and the WWF Earth calculator might be a good way to help do so. Um, there are plenty of other metrics online where you can help judge what your greatest impact is and then think specifically about the area that is your greatest impact. How can I change that? How can I improve that? I completely agree with you because like let's say if there are 100 people feeling in a chain or metro, metro that 100 people need to be divided into four in each of their own cars. So that's a huge emission if everyone is going to take their own cars to different places. And as you mentioned earlier, it, it, it's indeed um, true because every ecosystem, no matter what or how, is linked with each other. Let's say our, our planet's poles are like air conditioned systems reflecting the sun's uh, sunlight away from the planet to keep it cool. And fresh water system transport life in water, you know, crisscrossing its surface like arches and veins in a body. So just now, what do you think? How can we reintroduce nature into our own cities? How can we bring biodiversity, wildlife, and indeed all these unique creatures back to our cities so we can live with them? Well, that's one of the most interesting developments in ecology, really over, over the past 50 years, has been the development of urban ecology. This understanding that actually our, our cities are maybe not as uh, hostile to uh, wildlife and wild species as we maybe thought they were. Um, now, if we'd have gone back a, a few hundred years ago, it's likely that uh, any writer of the time would be able to tell you that. Um, so historically, for example, in London, um, kites were regularly seen in the city, a bird that by the mid 20th century was incredibly rare in the UK and is only now beginning to recover and recolonize the country. But we're aware now that, for example, whether it's urban carnivores in the US, from mountain lions to black bears, to the history of um, species in cities in Asia, to urban foxes in the UK, <clears throat> that there is a long and diverse history of, of species living alongside humans in cities. And possibly the example that I would draw on as one of the best is New York City, one of the world's largest and arguably most famous cities, that has a really healthy population of peregrine falcons. And New York City has essentially created a novel environment that happens to suit peregrine falcons very well. Now, in the process of living alongside those amazing animals, we can help foster habitat that will support them. So providing patches of green space for mammals, supporting the nesting of peregrines on tall buildings. That's something that not only could happen in New York City, but also happens here in the UK. Um, cities like Nottingham um, support uh, peregrine breeding through nest boxes, for example. 
So there are plenty of techniques that we can apply when wildlife decides to move into cities or, or indeed is, is still there, it might have never gone away. And a lot of the very best examples that we can look to come from India, which of course has a long history of living alongside species and cities and has some really inspiring examples that I think a lot of the rest of the world can learn from. Uh, true indeed, it's, it's really exciting to know that people are today living with animals, but they don't know it. And because, of course, biodiversity brings stability and no species has ever benefited from that except us humans. So, um, just speaking about all these um, things, so m many people think that um, because we are living in cities, we are far away from the natural world, we don't depend on it. And uh, some, some say, okay, if I take action, it's, nothing is going to happen. It should be a group activity. It's not mine, it's, it's the conservationists. So now, Josh, what do you think? How can we inspire others to take action? So that's a, a good question. I think, I think the thing that I would fundamentally say, first and foremost, is that this is a challenge for all of us. Everything we do in our daily life depends on nature. Like whether it's the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the air we breathe, absolutely everything. And it's a mistake for us to think that there's someone out there who is going to go and save the world. That person is us. The responsibility comes down to us, each and every one of us. And we can be that superhero, that person that steps up to save the natural world. But it requires each of us to take action. And it's amazing when you do so, how people will follow. People will, will see what you're doing and be inspired to take action. And I think, therefore, the single most important thing that we can each do is take action in our own lives because that will set a practical example. That will set an example that your friends and family will follow. Um, I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this in lots of other people's lives. And the simple act of taking small actions can have an impact. And it has an impact because of this ripple effect where it affects our friends and families. And in turn, that affects people they maybe know. Um, and that is fundamentally important, just taking action ourselves. Yes, indeed, absolutely true. So uh, that, that, that's exactly what, what uh, each of us need to do, because there are many small steps that we can take, whether it's first is awareness, understanding the natural world, reducing the amount of waste we create, waste of food, energy, or whatever it is, and uh, plastic, and then we have got, we have got planting more trees, because as trees grow back, they, they lock the carbon again in the soil, helping, you know, re-stabilize the climate. But, but again, we are reaching a point of no return, the dead zone. We have, uh, I think, what it, it said that they've got only 10 years, right? Only 10 years. Well, um, <clears throat> certainly in terms of climate change, to take decisive action, um, really 2020 was the date that a lot of the first environmental targets around climate change came in. Um, obviously, we've just gone past that. Uh, and that window between 2020 and 2030, in terms of uh, the amount of, in particular, uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing is going to be absolutely critical. Um, the time frame is slightly different for a lot of other environmental challenges, but we know the horrifying rate that we're losing biodiversity. And once it's lost, it's almost impossible to bring back. So if we, if we don't want to degrade our environment, if we don't want to lose any more species than we've already lost, then yes, absolutely, the point of time is now, right now. <laughs> so, Joshua, you have heard the news about the Amazon becoming carbon emitter and a carbon sink, some parts of it. So now, um, what do you think is the main reason that Amazon, despite being a hugely biodiverse area, because from whoever you ask, whether it's a small child, an old person, what is the most biodiverse ecosystem on Earth? The first thing which comes to mind is the Amazon rainforest. So now, What's happening in the Amazon? Why are we losing biodiversity there? So, as you've mentioned, the Amazon is incredibly biodiverse and historically it's one of the world's most important carbon sinks. That is an environment that, that takes in and, and locks up carbon uh, from the atmosphere. Um, part of the reason that it's shifted <coughs> uh, towards um, a situation where human practices around the Amazon, and that's really fundamental, this is what it's about, are causing 
greenhouse gas emissions. They're not helping take in carbon. They're they're doing quite the contrast. Um, is is around human activity in the Amazon region. So the, the Amazon's been inhabited for thousands of years by humans, but it's been inhabited by indigenous groups who have a fairly uh, sustainable lifestyle, who live in close contact with the natural world, um, and who consume very few resources. <clears throat> What's increasingly happening in the Amazon region, and it happened throughout the 20th century, and there's been a, a recent spike in 2020 and 2021, uh, in the 21st century, has been a move towards other groups um, beginning to move into the Amazon region and looking to convert areas, for example, into um, suitable land for raising livestock. And that means clearing areas of forest. Another big issue is uh, legal mining in the Amazon region. Now, often this um, has cultural and social implications as well, because that land is often um, rightly owned by those indigenous groups who are maybe disenfranchised by that process um, and other outsiders coming to essentially take uh, their resources. Um, but that also has tremendous environmental impacts as well. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of your listeners will be horrified by what has happened in the Amazon over the past couple of years. Um, certainly the directives um, from the Brazilian government um, have encouraged that. I, I don't think that's any controversy to, to say that. Um, that's widely understood and recognised. Um, and really, um, as the world, and particularly as Brazil, because of course the Amazon extends over multiple different countries, but the largest proportion is, is, is in Brazil, we need to come together if we're to protect the Amazon, both as an incredibly biodiverse place and as a, a carbon sink um, and it is so important to the world um, and as I say it's it's all really down to human activities and specifically human activities that have been encouraged in the past couple of years um, and quite damagingly so. So Joshua speaking about of course cattle as you mentioned earlier for the land but of course it's, I think I think so that it was said that they not only play a role in deforestation, but also cattle such as, let's say, cow, are really release a lot of methane as well. So it is dangerous in all ways. Now, uh, of course, I, I think the best solution is going plant-based diet. Do you think that's the case? I, I, I do think it, it would have a huge benefit if we could get large amounts of work to shift towards a plant-based diet. <clears throat> Part of the issue there is that um, you can take one of two approaches you can either try and shift a proportion of the population towards plant-based diets or you can try and get everyone to cut their meat and fish consumption <clears throat> and personally I, I suspect that's possibly a more realistic target because there are um there are uh, plenty of uh, cultures and societies that have eating meat or fish as an important cultural component of their society there are plenty of individuals who um, feel they could never give it up entirely. But I think the message that I would give for those individuals is that you can still make a change. You can still make a difference. You can choose to eat less meat. You can choose to eat less fish. You can choose to get your fish from sustainable sources. You can choose to pick meat, which has a lower carbon impact. Um, obviously, full credit to those individuals who have already taken the step to have a plant-based diet, that's fantastic and that's will make it a huge impact. But I think now I would speak to those who don't feel that's for them and say that that's okay, but there is still action you can take. There is still steps that you can take to make your diet more balanced and more sustainable in the long run. It's fundamentally very important. Now, Richard, what do you think of uh, plastic pollution and overfishing itself? Two different but very important issues that both affect our ocean. Um, plastic pollution is something that's really come onto the public stage and into the public consciousness over the past 10 years, thanks to, um, for example, David Attenborough's uh, Blue Planet series with the BBC, which really helped highlight this issue as, as a global issue. And I've seen that myself. Um, we were up in a, a remote, uninhabited part of the Arctic a few years ago, 
and there was plastic pollution washed up on the beach. This is somewhere that is hundreds of miles away from the nearest large human settlement. Yet there is plastic pollution even here in this remote and seemingly pristine part of the world. And for a long time, as scientists, we just thought that was unsightly. But now there's an increasing understanding that that can have an impact on wildlife, whether that's um, through toxicity uh, in the environment or whether it's actually through direct mortality. So a great example is from the South Atlantic Ocean, where scientific research has begun to show that um, seabirds will often see pieces of plastic floating in the water. They'll scoop down, pick it up, thinking it's a fish. They'll take it back to their nest and they'll um, regurgitate it for their chicks. Um, the chicks could either choke on the plastic and uh, that can prove fatal, um, or because they're consuming essentially these products which provide absolutely no nutrition for them, they end up starving over time because they're not taking on the calories that they otherwise need to. So we've switched our understanding from this idea that plastic pollution is, is just unsightly, it's just messy, towards actually, no, this has a real conservation impact. Um, overfishing is obviously a, a huge concern and there have been very worrying signs from around the world, whether it's mass trawler fleets off the Galapagos Islands, this kind of pristine natural environment, um, to the decline of a huge range of fish stocks. I think the thing about overfishing is that it, taking action on overfishing doesn't mean that we have to stop eating fish, everyone, <clears throat> but it does mean we have to stop eating some types of fish <laughs> and that we have to think about more sustainable ways to produce fish. So again, speaking in the case of Europe, one of the good examples is that actually river fish um, are a lot more sustainable. Um, organic fish farms um, actually have real conservation benefits um, because it, it prevents um, resistance to certain diseases and therefore the cultivation and development of things, for example, like sea lice, um, which can have a devastating impact on wild populations. Um, shellfish are often, um, or certain shellfish are often very sustainable in Europe compared to um, other more endangered fish stocks. So it's really thinking about what we, what do we need to cut out of our diets and where can we move towards more sustainable alternatives? Indeed, because um, speaking about plastic, it is really not that good because indeed it, it returns back to us in the fish that we eat and uh, toxicity, all these different problems it's got. And talking about overfishing, of course, is that we are losing um, huge amounts of fish and uh, some of them are going to face uh, waste, of course. And I've seen why myself in the past um, 10 years or something that even the, the size of those fishes we are, we are catching are decreasing. And uh, not only the population size, but the population of uh, the size of themselves. So it is, it is, it is an alarming sign, um, yet we can um, help it. So, so Joshua, what's your message to all the audience here today? I think my key message is think about your individual impact. Think about the area of your life that has the greatest impact on the natural world and work out how you can take action for it. It might require bold and radical and creative thinking. For example, uh, as I talked about taking bus or taking the train, these long, long distances, if, if that applies to you. But we can do this, we can protect the natural world, but it starts with us recognizing the areas of impact in our own life and taking action on that. And that will inspire other people. I've got no doubt about that. And so take action, do what you can, and that will hopefully lead others to follow your example. And so I think ultimately it would be a, a message of, of hope, but also a message of action, because we really do need to act now. Yes, indeed, we need to act now. So Joshua, this, it was great having you today with us. Really amazing. I myself want oh. to learn a lot about saving the planet uh, and all the things we discussed about. And I wish you all the best so we can meet you soon once again. Thank you for joining Thanks. us today. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. I mean, I've always been interested in nature. Kind of Mother Nature's perfect animal, you know? Seeing Nile crocodiles and being kind of terrified. Welcome to the Nature Talks podcast. <laughs>